everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm Stepan Schindelaj. I work for Oracle Labs, and I'm going to talk about the Truffle and Growl project that is being developed at Oracle Labs. Uh, as a Labs employee, I have to tell you that what I'm going to talk about is research, so you shouldn't buy any Oracle stock just because of that. Now we are cleared, we can continue. So first, we're going to take a look at the problems that uh, Truffle and Growl are trying to solve. Then we're going to take a look at the Truffle component of this combo, and we're going to take a look at that in a bit more detail. Then I'm going to mention the Growl compiler, but not in so much detail, because we don't have enough time for that. And then finally, the most. So the problem number one. Imagine that you want to implement a programming language. It might be a re-implementation of existing programming language, or maybe you just designed a new programming language that is very novel and is going to change the world. And the only thing you need to do is to implement it. So what you do, you start with writing a parser. Out of parser, uh, you get uh, what's, it call, what's called AST, abstract syntax tree. That's what you usually do. And once you have AST, you're going to write AST interpreter. I'm going to explain those things later. But the point here is that this is not going to be that difficult. You can use your favorite language for that. And it's not going to take so much time. The problem here is that this is not going to be very efficient. So you might decide to write a real virtual machine for your language. And then maybe some people will actually start using it. So they will force you, because they would complain about performance, they will force you to write uh, to define a bytecode and write bytecode interpreter, to write a, a JIT compiler, to improve the garbage collector, maybe implement a few more garbage collectors for different workloads, uh, write optimizing JIT compiler, etc. And then maybe after 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, you will, will be finished and your language can finally change the world. Only, only maybe it's going to be too late. Another problem, uh, we live in a polyglot world. Like most of us use more than one language on a daily basis, or at least weekly basis, I would say. And the thing is that there are languages that are suitable for certain tasks, like R or Python are maybe useful for machine learning, data science, things like that. Uh, and let's say JavaScript with Node.js is, is useful and easy to use for web programming. So what if you have a web application that's where you want to do some machine learning? Uh, you can do some sort of communication between the languages, but it's not going to be very efficient, or you're going to write the whole thing in one of those languages, and you're going to make a compromise. And we don't want compromises. Another thing is that uh, when you implement your new shiny language, you're not going to have libraries. So what you really need is some sort of interoperability with existing ecosystem so that you get the libraries for free. Now, of course, you probably are going to say, any language can execute on JVM or Microsoft CLR and communicate with other languages that execute on JVM or CLR. What I'm going to say is that this, you can do that efficiently only as long as it looks like Java or C Sharp. So the problem here is that if you translate your language to bytecode, you're going to lose. So your language probably is going to have some very like abstract operations in it. And you're going to lose this abstraction. You're going to lose the semantic information when you translate to bytecode. And the, and the bytecode jitter can't exploit that, or at least easily exploit that when compiling the code. Uh, another problem is that, at least in hotspots, for example, you can do speculative uh, optimizations. Now, this can be very useful for when you want to compile some dynamic behavior. Uh, but you can't really easily exploit that when you generate bytecode from or with bytecode, basically. So you probably guessed it. The answer to all that is truffle. Uh, so what the ideal world should look like with truffle is that you're going to write a parser. Truffle is not going to help you with that, but there are many parser generators out there. And then you're going to write AST interpreter using truffle API. Needless to say, this is Java. We're talking about Java, so you're going to do all that in Java, uh, which I would argue is, is slightly better than in C. Um, and then, if you do this, you get all the rest for free. 
and that's that's awesome or at least we think it's awesome uh, so let's take a look at how this is done first thing AST interpreter programming languages can be usually parsed into tree like structure what you can do is that you represent each node in this tree by an object that implements so let's say we're in Java that implements certain interface that has execute method and then when you want to do the execute method of addition for example you're going to divide and conquer you're going to call the execute method of your left child your right child and then you're going to do the thing that your node is actually supposed to do it doesn't have to care about what the left child is going to do how it's going to implement the execute method whether it's going to be a constant a function call or whatnot you don't care about it so that's why it's a nice and neat way to implement an interpreter of course you see there uh, the interface calls so it's not going to be very efficient uh, another problem that you can spot on this slide is is obvious syntax error here and it's got to do something with the biggest problem of uh, dynamic languages and and that's the thing that when you have a plus operation uh, until runtime you don't really know what it means what you should do until you evaluate the left child and right child, you don't really know if that's going to be a string concatenation, integer addition, or maybe something else completely crazy. So you have to execute it, and then you're going to find out. So to overcome these problems, Truffle uses two concepts. First of them is self-optimizing AST interpreter. The idea is that when you parse your function, let's say, and when you construct the AST uh, nodes, the, the objects that represent the abstract syntax tree, uh, you're going you're gonna to create what we call uninitialized nodes. So you're going to create uninitialized addition node, for example. And this node, in its execute method, it will execute the left child, right child, and then it's going to take a look at the results. And depending upon them, it's going to rewrite itself. So it's going to replace itself in the AST reconnect all the edges and replace itself in the AST with a version that's more specialized that can handle only the types that this uninitialized node received when it was first time executed. So let me rephrase that we create the AST with uninitialized nodes, then we execute the AST, we interpret the function that we've created the AST for for the first time. And so at runtime, we find out the arguments or the child's types, and then we decide into which node we're going to rewrite. Now, of course, when we rewrite to integer addition node, and we get executed for the next time, we still have to check the operands, that they are still valid integers. We're not going to add uh, strings with integer addition. But the thing here is that we're going to do only two things. We're going to check that the operands are valid for the operation that we want to do, and then we do the operation itself. If the operands are not valid, we're going to rewrite our node to a different node, a more generic one. With integers here, we can rewrite to doubles, but if the double node doesn't get double operands or integer operands, uh, it will rewrite to a generic node, and the generic node on the bottom there, uh, it, that will stay, that will never rewrite itself, and it will implement the whole thing, like all the checks, everything at the beginning that I was saying we want to avoid. So to go further, we need another concept that Truffle uses, and that's called partial evaluation. Imagine that you have a function of two variables. Now we multiply the first one and add the second one. If we say, if we decide that we're going to fix the first argument, what we can do, we can pre-evaluate the multiplication and save that. So. This way we can uh, save some computation if we know that uh, a parameter to our function is fixed. Now, so now imagine that we have function run and we give it AST node that represents a function, for example, and some variables table, let's say. And then let's say we fix the node to be an instance of uh, AST that is representing this A plus two. Now, because we already know uh, the type of the node, the node executed on the left-hand side is interface call, but we, on the, when we are partially evaluating it with uh, knowing that uh, the type of the node, we can inline the execute method. And if the fields, the left and right child, are final, and we can assume that they are not going to change, we can also inline 
uh, invocation of the execute method on them. And this way we can inline everything and get a nice sequential piece of code. Uh, now, if we're going to put this together, what we do is that we uh, create our AST with uninitialized nodes, then we're going to interpret the AST for a while. The nodes rewrite themselves depending on the arguments. So the assumption here is that if you have a function, let's say uh, POW, like POV, uh, you're probably going to call this one with numbers. You're probably not likely to call it with strings or objects or whatnot. So the AST of this function will eventually stabilize, uh, and we would have some specializations there. And once this happens, we're going to partially evaluate this, and we're going to get a sequential piece of code. You can imagine it like a, a Java method. Uh, we sort of kicked away the abstraction with the interface calls to the execute methods and everything. And we can then compile this to efficient machine code. Uh, so what we're going to compile in the machine code in the case of the integer addition node, the specialized version of the addition node for integers, is those two operations I was talking about. Check the operands and do the actual integer addition. Now, you might argue that this rewrite the node thing, when we partially evaluate the code, this rewrite the node thing will eventually lead to the double addition node and to the generic addition node because that's what is going to happen. Is that the node's going to replace itself with some uh, less specialized version. So at the end of the day, don't we just pull in by the partial evaluation all the code that we wanted to avoid? And the answer to this question is uh, we do a little trick. Uh, when we do the partial evaluation, at the point of the rewrite, we stop the partial evaluation and to the machine code, we insert a uh, deopt operation, which is basically, it means we're going to call back to the VM and we're going to tell it, hey, our assumptions that we've made when compiling this code are wrong, and we just don't want to continue with this code anymore at all. Just uh, 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 take it away, don't execute it anymore. And then what the VM would do is that it would go back to the interpreter, the AST interpreter. It has to remember the AST structure, right? So it goes back to the AST interpreter, and then it does this AST interpretation thing again. For a while, the nodes rewrite themselves, etc., and then maybe at some point it stabilizes again. And so what we can do, partially evaluate it again. So this is, in a nutshell, how, the, how Truffle can deliver fast performance by only implementing an AST interpreter. Now, at the beginning, it was a bit of a sales pitch. You don't in, uh, implement a simple AST interpreter. You have to do these rewritings. So you have to think a bit more about the code that you implement than, than with just a simple AST interpreter. But I would argue it's much easier than writing a, a JIT compiler, let's say. Uh, there are Truffle-based languages uh, implemented in Oracle Labs. Uh, JavaScript, Ruby, and FastR. I, I am working on FastR with other guys. And those are dynamic languages. What it might be interesting is that there is also implementation of LLVM IR interpreter. Now, LLVM bitcode, that's uh, intermediate representation um, that this LLVM project is using, and Clang, for example, compiles C to LLVM bitcode. Now, you might want to ask why, for God's sakes, why do I want to interpret C? I can compile it and run it, and it's going to be very fast, right? So there are two things, the reason for doing this. Now, if we're going to implement uh, interpret C on top of JVM, what we're going to get is memory safety. So you can run OpenSSL, for example, with memory safety, without the fear of buffer overflows or anything like that. And the second thing is that most of those languages that are on this slide have some sort of uh, native function interface. So you can implement some functionality in C, Fortran, whatnot, and compile it to a bi binary, and then call that from your language. Uh, of course, you want to have this implemented in your imp uh, implementation of, let's say, R or Ruby. Otherwise, it's going to be a toy implementation, really. Uh, native uh, extensions are really important. Uh, but with, if we have interpreter of C, 
we can nicely combine everything together. So that's the second problem, the interoperability. If we have AST interpreters of those languages that are implemented using the common interface, that are implemented using the same AST uh, interface, what we can just do is that we can put them together. So uh, here we have some access to a C struct that's been made from Ruby, I think. Uh, we can just take the AST of that access to a C struct and then connect it under the Ruby AST. And then just e interpret all this together and it's gonna get specialized and then we can just partially evaluate everything together. And then everything can get inlined across language boundaries. Your constants can be pro propagated from Ruby to C and it's gonna be all efficient. So that was Truffle. Uh, now, um, uh, the Graal compiler. The Graal compiler, it's actually the bit that does the partial evaluation, and then it compiles the partially evaluated code. Graal compiler is modern alternative to the Hotspot C2. It uses the Java compiler interface, JVM CI, and it's written in Java. So it can be uh, a nice platform to experiment with novel compiler optimizations, things like that. Uh, there was a GPU presentation before. Uh, I was mentioning the project Sumatra. That's, uh, that's a project that uses Graal to compile code into uh, GPU code. Uh, so that's, uh, I think, Java lambdas are compiled to GPU um, and run on GPU. Um, Kral uh, was rel is relatively new compared to C2, so it takes into account all the abstractions that we are used to use in Java nowadays and in Scala and other languages. So uh, it can be especially good with workloads that use lambdas, uh, streams, things like that. Uh, yeah, so that's it. Uh, there is a, something called GraalVM. It's like an umbrella project for all that I was talking about. Um, this is basically a distribution of JDK with Graal, or modified JDK with Graal, and with all the languages that it, we implement. That's R, JavaScript, and Ruby. Also with Node.js, based on the JavaScript implementation. Um, and you can download it from GitHub. I will have a link on the, the final slide. So yeah, that brings us to demo use. So here we are in uh, GraalVM in the bin directory. You can see some things that you might be familiar with, like Java, Javac. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, run what we call a multilingual shell. So it's a REPL where you can run, can you see that? Probably. It's a REPL where you can run several languages at once. So we are in JavaScript now. We can switch to R or to Ruby. Um, I don't know much JavaScript, but I think this should work. You might notice that it takes a while for the first time, but hopefully it's going to be a bit fast the next time. So I'm going to define yes, func some function. And we're going to lock something to console. And then we're going to return this two stars thing, which is puff. Uh, so that's it. We have JS function. What we can do here is we can say in interop export JS fun. So we are exporting the function to be used by other languages. They can access it by this name, JS font. Uh, so we can switch to R, for example. And we can say fast R interop import JS font. And it's R, so assignment is a error, not equals. Uh, we get the JS font and we can call it. Now we can see hello world from JavaScript. 
The problem is that don't, we don't see the return value. Now, R is very peculiar language. Uh, it's got built-in REPL functionality. So all the functions not only re return a value, but they also tell you if that value should be shown on REPL or not. Now, if we import a function from another language, we don't know that. So by default, we assume that the value shouldn't be printed. We have to just save it into a variable, print it out, and here we have it. So, yes, that was GraalVM. And now I said I, I'm working uh, on fast R, so let's take a look at GNUR. Uh, R is a language for statisticians, uh, used for machine learning, uh, data science, all that. Uh, it's got some very interesting properties, like everything here is a vector, so when I say len length one, it's one. Uh, you can create vectors by this combine function, and then you can index into them. But of course, everything is a vector, so an uh, index can be a vector as well. Uh, you can also say 10, for example. It's not going to give you a bound exception, but it's going to put an A in there. That's a special thing in R. That means not available. So if you collect surveys from people, for example, they don't want to answer some questions, you put NAs in there, then R can work with that. If you add one to an A, it's an A. If you divide an A by an A, it's an A. It's awesome. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to define those two functions. The first one uh, basically adds one to its first argument only as long as the second argument is greater than 10. The second one. Uh, basically adds one by one to r, the variable r, but it does it through calling bar. So we have some sort of unnecessary abstraction here. Um, and the r variable is initialized with something that we give to foo. So there's this uh, system time built-in function in r we can use to benchmark this. And I'm going to run this with 10. Uh, going to get some result eventually. It took us five and a half seconds, let's say. Uh, R has a JIT compiler, but uh, no tiered compilation. So uh, it's not going to get any better. More times we call it. It was once compiled, JIT compiled, and that that's it. Uh, now, let me go to fast R. Uh, you can see at the top that it's not R, it's fast R. Uh, I'm going to put here the same functions. I'm going to say system time foo 10. And it's going to take a while, almost three seconds. Uh, the ASD was specializing itself. It was compiled by Growl. And now it gets slightly faster. We get to 20 milliseconds. What I like about Graal is that it can do time traveling. So we traveled one, one millisecond back here. Uh, that's going to take a look at what's going on under the hood. I'm going to run this with this uh, Graal trace truffle compilation details true, true. So I'm going to put in the same functions. And we're going to run it. So now we can see that something is going on. Uh, the screen is too small for that. Uh, here we can see something like optimization queued for the bar function. Uh, then we started compiling it uh, at some point, maybe. Somewhere we're done. Yeah, it's somewhere there. We also compile the body of the for loop in the foo function, so Graal can do on stack replacement uh, for loop bodies. So let's execute a few more times. Now the whole thing stabilizes, sort of, and now it's stable. Now I forgot to say that this L after the 10 here uh, means integer. So that's how you write integer literals in R. 
uh, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to change it to some double number. And we're going to see that the optimization happened. And uh, the whole thing was compiled again. It's going to take a while before it stabilizes. And hopefully now it gets stable. Now, the time traveling can be interesting. Eight milliseconds. Uh, uh, so yeah, so this was R and how fast it can be. Uh, now I want to show you this thing. Uh, this is uh, some website. Uh, what you can see here is a visualization of linear regression model. That's probably something like hello world of machine learning, I guess. Uh, what we have here, those points are cities. Uh, this axis, that's, that's a latitude. And we have current temperature here. What we can do here is that we can say, Put here some city. Did I click on that? And then we get a prediction based on this model. So it's not it's not totally accurate, but yeah, it's hello world. Uh, the thing here is that this visualization and this uh, linear regression model that was all created by R. Now the data for the uh, current temperatures of in the cities. Uh, that's downloaded from Open Weather API, and this is done by using Open Weather to uh, Ruby Gem. So this is Ruby giving us the temperature data and giving it to R, which creates this linear regression model. But it is a website, right? So let's take a look at the network tab where we say predict. We can find out that this is powered by Express, uh, Express.js. That's a framework used in Node.js for uh, web applications. So this is a combination of all the three languages. Let's take a look at the source code. This is the part of, uh, the, this is the Ruby part. We're requiring the open weather module. Uh, we're defining a, a weather uh, module here, and then we are using this interop export, we're exporting this module to be used by other languages. Now, the R part, if you know any R, you might know about these libraries, maps and lattice. Lattice is used for visualization. Maps got this database of cities in the world. Uh, we have here functions like create model, do predict, plot model. Uh, by the way, this is using SVG. Um, and we export all those functions to be used by a Node.js application that's going to include the Ruby code, the R code, and it's going to import functions, and then it's uh, going to create a web server. So this is it. Um, there is a one route that I created for the purpose of this presentation, and that's um, slash test, and here you can see something that might be familiar to you if you're Java developers. It's Java Util Stream in Stream range. So here we can see a Nashorn style interoperability where we uh, reaching to Java to create an in stream of this range. Then we are calling the filter function, and that's the Java method on in stream in Java, but we are giving it a JavaScript function that is going to filter the things. And then at the end, we're going to call the Java sum function. It's going to add all of them together. Let's try this. Test. Should work, yeah. So yeah, that's it. Uh, another thing uh, uh, is that uh, because we are on JVM, right? Uh, interoperability with Java should be really easy, simple, and efficient. So what I have here is a, a Swing uh, application. It creates some Swing UI. And here in the paint method, we are calling some show on some interface. Now, if we take a look at that interface, it's here. It's regular Java interface. Uh, but what we have here is uh, Truffle API, usage of Truffle API. We create a polyglot engine 
Then we create some source. I put it in line, but you can just load it from a file. And in this source, we have our code. Uh, we are doing uh, k-means clustering. Uh, notice here that we are loading libraries, two libraries that's grid and lattice, and those libraries are used for visualization only. Uh, but we use k-means clustering here. It's a built-in in R, so that gives you an idea about what you can do in R like easily with the built-ins. Um, and then we're just going to say engine eval this source code and whatever this source code evaluates to give me that as implementation of that interface. And then you can just work, it, work with it as with any other in interface uh, you would work in Java. So let me run this. Now that's actually Java, this uh, delay. Uh, and here we can see the visualization of k-means clustering algorithm. Uh, the only thing we needed to do to implement this was to call k-means function. We didn't have to download any additional libraries or anything. Uh, we just had to call k-means clustering function and another function that would visualize this. And it's all in Java. This is uh, the graphics to the object that we paint into. The R is painting into. Java's graphic studio object to paint all this. So that's done. I was talking about the speed of and uh, the efficiency of interoperability. So let me go to. Uh, uh, so what I'm going to do now. Here we have this guy. So here we have a JavaScript implementation of the what is known as a sieve of Aristoteles algorithm. That's algorithm that gives you um, prime numbers, right? Uh, it's deliberately written in very convoluted way with lots of unnecessary abstraction. Here, for example, we have a constructor of natural object that represents a natural number and here we have a function or method on it that increments it by one. So there's like lots of abstraction going on here, right? And so the whole thing that this program does is that it's, that it, it's gonna print the first uh, 10,000, I think, uh, prime numbers. And it's gonna do that in a, in a loop. What I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna run it on normal node.js. Uh, Let's see. If so that's Node.js. That's um, Node.js internally uses V8, which is Google's uh, JavaScript engine, and it's probably I would say a state of the art between uh, engines for dynamic languages. And Google has invested lots of effort into making it efficient. It's a thing that runs JavaScript in your browser if you're using Chrome. Uh, so let's run it, and it's pretty fast. So it can compute the first 100,000 prime numbers in about 100 milliseconds. Now, uh, let's take a look at a different version, and that version will be almost the same in JavaScript, except that we are going to import this natural thing from some other language. And uh, sorry, I wanted to show the Ruby one, but it's the same. We're going to implement this natural thing from another language, and that another language will be Ruby. So here we are in Ruby. We define a class that wraps numbers, and it's got a method to add one to the number. So that's a lot of abstraction. And not only that, we are going to use that from JavaScript. So we're crossing language boundaries to add one. And crawl VM, let's see if um, we're going to run the Ruby version. So what I'm passing on the command line here are the two files where this is implemented. Uh, let's see if JavaScript, we're going to run it. Now, the warm-up takes a bit, 
because it has to do all the specializations, compilation at the background, all that. But hopefully after a while, after a few iterations, it is going to get fast. Uh, so we are actually slightly faster than Node.js. There are workloads where Node.js is faster. It's we are s somewhere close to each other. So yeah, so this is an example of high performance interoperability between the languages. As you can see, the not only the abstraction penalty for using all the objects and everything could be compiled away, but also the penalty for the communication between different languages. So, yeah. Uh, okay, I was much faster than I expected it to be. Uh, I should acknowledge uh, lots of other people that worked on this project. It was, of course, not only me. Uh, I only joined the project some year and a half ago, actually. Uh, many people worked on that. And uh, if you have any questions, there, there you can see the links to the GitHub repository. So most of the projects are open source. And we are hiring. Yeah. Doesn't work. OK, two questions. Can I? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so the, the, the first question, because uh, uh, you showed dynamic languages. And uh, for example, you have this example where you have two ints, addition of two ints. And on the 10,000 cases, it's two ints. But 10,001, it's two strings. Are you going to de-optimize the first time you, you encounter different parameters, or you yeah, try yeah. to speculate? Mm. So uh, if it was compiled already, partially evaluated and compiled, then you're going to de-optimize. But the idea is since the, the way the nodes are rewriting themselves is eventually going to lead to the generic node, you, you, might that few, do, you might do that a few times, but eventually you will reach the generic node, and there are no de-optimizations in there. So, okay. so you have some kind of control over the, the, the optimization from the API, or it's all? So yeah, uh, the, there are uh, several entry points in the API where you can control the, the optimization. There is a, a method that you can call to just de-optimize. Mm -hmm. uh, there is API uh, with on annotation with which you can tell the compiler that certain values, like fields values, will be constant uh, in compiled code, but don't have to be constant, so you don't have to define them final in your code. So what you can do this, you can use this to sort of, if some assumption that you made, and you don't have to make assumptions only about types, you can make assumptions about everything. Uh, so you can make an assumption and then save it into a field and say that this field is compilation final. And then if that assumption turns out to be wrong, you can just say de-optimize and invalidate. Okay. So, so, so the second question, uh, because you already talked about the C uh, mm -hmm. on, on Graal, and I've read an article about the manage C uh, idea. So the question is, isn't it like solving the problem of the Java native interface? If we could use Graal, to implement it, because you know this is the problematic part. You know, calling native code. Uh, so you mean that we wouldn't need uh, the JNI. The JNI, if we had this, it, yeah, that, that that would be awesome. The thing is that with JNI, you're actually not calling only C. You're calling uh, native binaries, right? You don't have to have their source code. Uh, they can be compiled by Free Pascal, for example, or something like that. Uh, with this, you need to have the source code, and not only the source code of of your project, but source code of all the dependencies. Yeah. yeah um, I don't know if you intentionally uh, didn't touch on that or not. I'm, I'm curious uh, at its current form how Growl uh, kind of stacks up to C2. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't have slides for that, but uh, you can definitely Google some slides uh, with benchmarks for that. Uh, we're running uh, Dacapo and some other benchmark suites. Um, and uh, Graal is slightly slower on, I would call that traditional benchmarks. And it, it can be like, um, well, it depends if you call like 10 or 20% significant, but it can be significantly faster on uh, Scala workloads. So it can, so the thing is that it can, it's got very good 
uh, uh, it's got very good uh, escape analysis. So escape analysis uh, tries to guess or find out which objects escape your method so that they don't have to be allocated on the managed heap, but they can be put on the stack, for example, or that you can just put them away and replace them with Scala values. And this, is, this was especially important for Graal because of the partial evaluation thing. Because there we have the nodes, those are classes, and we want to uh, analyze whether they escape or not and inline them and replace them with scholars. So uh, Graal is especially good at this, and this turns out to be useful for uh, uh, Scala. But I, I would say it's probably useful for like um, uh, modern high-level high, high uh, Java code with streams and lambdas and all that. Yeah, are there any other questions? I guess if not, that's, that's all I had prepared. Uh, yeah, thank you for your attention.